Okay, Magdalena has shared uh, the agenda with you in the chat. Uh, I'm going to um, uh, share the link of sessions with you, um, which points to all the forthcoming sessions, including um, how to join them. And I also share the YouTube uh, link and you'll see where it appears, the, um, where the recording appears and you can share it with um, your colleagues. Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank and you. Today, uh, today's speaker is Maria Cruz from the Dutch Research Council Policy. Um, and uh, I think um, uh, I'm going to uh, hand over to Magdalena so that she can make the introductions. Um, okay, Magdalena, you take over now. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. And um, so today we are joined by Maria Cruz, who is a policy advisor, open science at the executive board office at the Dutch Research Council. NWO. Uh, she is the contact person for the NWO research data management policy. And since joining NWO two years ago, she developed the NWO Open Science Fund and the NWO PID strategy. Uh, she has a PhD and research background in astrophysics, which is very interesting to me. Uh, could never study that. <laughs> and over 10 years of experience in scholarly communication. Before joining NWO, she worked in research support roles at the Delft University of Technology and the Free University of Amsterdam, uh, where she specialized in open science, research data management, and fair data. She's one of the authors of Research Data Alliance, Alliance Engaging Researchers with Data Management, the cookbook. So this is a intro for Maria. I'm very jealous about the astrophysics. I'm, I'm really interested in all of these topics, but normally when they are explained in a very simple terms, but I'll mute myself and I hope Maria, you will be able to share your screen in case you have some notes um, or slides you want to share with us. If not, let me know. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, I do have slides. So I'm going to share them now and always like the hope that uh, I don't mess it up. Uh, let me see. Share. Try again. Sorry. I'll try again. I'm trying to put them in screen mode. Good. It's taking a little long. I don't no know. worries. Okay, so now you can see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, research data management at the Dutch Research Council, NVO. Uh, yeah, I won't be talking about astrophysics. No, it's been a long, long time ago. Uh, yeah, and uh, as uh, Magdalena said, I, I work at the NVO as policy officer in the area of open science, and I, I look after our research data management policy. I, I see uh, some uh, colleagues from the Netherlands, but I also see uh, a lot of people from outside the Netherlands. So I'll, I'll introduce NVO. So we all know what, what the Dutch Research Council is. So the Dutch Research Council is the main uh, research funder in the Netherlands. It funds, uh, yeah, re research at public, uh, at public research institutions. And uh, yeah, besides funding, we do fund uh, research, but uh, we also uh, yeah, invest in large scale facilities and infrastructure. And we actually have a research performing arm. We, we do have um, uh, research institutes, although our main activity is funding research. Uh, we also do have uh, research performing institutes in our uh, organization. In terms of uh, research funding, uh, these are, well, Oh yeah, the key figures from uh, our annual report from 2020. 
So just just to situate NVO, uh, so in, 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 one, in 2020, we spent 1 billion euros uh, funding uh, research and researchers and research infrastructure. Actually, a lot of the, the money we spent uh, uh, funds uh, research FTEs. Uh, last year, we found over 5,000 uh, uh, research uh, staff at various research institutes in the Netherlands. Uh, we receive every year about 7,000 applications and we are able to fund about uh, just under uh, 1,200 uh, last year. But in any given year, we have about uh, 700 projects uh, in progress. That means uh, projects that are either uh, ongoing or completed uh, in, in that year. Uh, so, so that also gives you an idea of um, uh, well, I'll, talk, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll talk about data management plans, but gives you an idea of how many da you know, data management plans and things like that we, we are talking about per year. Uh, so, so this is NVO in a nutshell. Um, as yeah, I, I'm a policy officer, Open Science. So I'll talk a bit about Open Science. It's the strategic priority for NVO. Uh, NVO is committed to Open Science. And so we have policies aimed at ensuring that publicly funded research outputs are as open as possible, uh, closed where necessary for the benefit of science and society. So we fund research uh, with uh, taxpayers' money. So we find it important that yeah, everybody can access the results of the research we fund. Uh, and and we, we do have um, an open access policy uh, for publication since 2009. And, and the research data management policy since 2016. I won't say much, I won't say anything at all about our open access policy or, or very little. And uh, I'll, I'll say a lot about our RDM policy. Before I, I focus on RDM, I just wanted to show some results of a survey we conducted last year, last in, uh, in the fall, in, in November, I think we had this special issue of our magazine, Onderzoek, that translates to research. Uh, Onderzoek is, means research in Dutch. So we have this magazine in November. We had a special issue focusing on open science. And as part of their issue, we, we, well, we commissioned a, a company to send out a survey to 8,000 uh, applicants, uh, uh, researchers who had applied for funding in the last two years. Uh, we received about uh, just over a thousand responses, so it was about a 13% uh, response rate, which means that, the, the, I mean, it's not, we cannot say these responses are representative of all our applicants, but uh, we're really pleased to see that 80% of the people, who of the respondents were, have a positive or very positive attitude towards open science, but of course, you know, the, the survey was sent online, so people you know, could respond or not. And of course, I think the people who are more positive are more likely to respond to such a survey. Uh, so just to give the caveats of, of, of uh, what I'm going to present. But uh, uh, what we, so 95% so of respondents find publishing open access an important or very important aspect of open science and 83% of them always or regularly publish open access, which is, uh, very much in line with the um, a result we had last year. Last year, we monitored our open access compliance and we found that 85% of publications funded by NVO and published in 2020 are open access. So it, it really matches the people who say they are doing it, matches the, 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 the percentage of uh, papers uh, uh, that are published open access uh, funded by NVO. So that, that was great. We also heard that, uh, so 93% of the respondents find open data sharing an important or very important aspect of open science, but uh, only 56% of respondents always or regularly share open data, which I think it's, it's a great result actually that 56% uh, of, of the people who responded are, are already always or regularly sharing uh, data. That, that I think open data, that's fantastic. Um, as I said, we've had an open access policy since 2009, but only since 2016, uh, research data management policy. 
so yeah, we couldn't expect uh, such high numbers as, as for, for open access, but there are obviously obstacles to, to data sharing. People say they find it important, but yet they don't do it. We also did ask uh, in the survey, we asked what were the barriers people face, not for data sharing specifically, but for open science. And the responses were yeah, lack of infrastructure, lack of instructions and guidelines, and limited uh, time of funding. So, that, so those were the, the, the barriers and obstacles researchers said they face uh, with regards to open science. But it, it, these results showed us that there's still a lot to do in the area of uh, research data management, open data and fair data. Uh, so, so that people who are actually find it important are also uh, doing it. So I'll now move to uh, research data management and fair data at NVO. Um, we have a, a research data management policy since 2016. In 2015, we ran a pilot in only a couple of funding uh, programs. It was successful. So in October 2016, the, the data management policy went into force across uh, all of the funding programs. And since then, uh, researchers are expected to carefully manage all research data generated uh, uh, as part of NVO funded projects with the, the, the principle, the motto, uh, as open and fair as possible, as closed as necessary. And we did embrace the fair principles already in 2016 when they were also published. Um, and how, this, yeah, how, how do we uh, op operationalize this policy? Uh, all grant application forms have a research data management section. These are four questions about data management, question, and the questions are, the, will data be uh, produced in the project? If so, how are you going to store and back up that data? How do we plan to uh, share it later at the end of the project? And also, uh, we ask researchers to think about budgets. Uh, the, 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 this data management section is not part of the evaluation of, of the grant assessment. Uh, it's more of at the time, and, and it's, it still is, but at the time even more so was more of a sort of awareness raising exercise. So researchers start thinking about data management at the beginning uh, when they start yeah, planning uh, the project and, and, and conceiving the project. Uh, and that the RDM costs are eligible for funding, so researchers can apply for um, costs for uh, research data management as part of their uh, budgets uh, for the proposal. And then if uh, a proposal is funded, that's when a data management plan is required. So we only required a data management plan for uh, successful uh, funded uh, grants for, for successful proposals. We only, uh, it needs to be submitted four months um, after the project has been awarded. It's the only time we, we require a data management plan. Uh, some uh, funding agencies required in the middle of the, uh, at the middle, at, at the end, we only require at the very beginning, but it is a condition for the project to start. But of course we do uh, in our guidance, we do encourage researchers to see the DMP as a living document, we encourage them to update the document, but we only uh, this, it's only a formal requirement at the beginning of the project. Uh, yeah, so I, I said our policy went into force in the 1st of October 2016, so it, it means that uh, last year on the 1st of October 2021, we celebrated the fifth anniversary of our research data management policy. We had some uh, internal events, but in uh, November, we had uh, an event, uh, um, a webinar, a panel discussion uh, with the topic, fair data, it takes a village. And, and that's something we learned or, or became aware since we, we, we uh, in, introduced the policy in 2016. You know, it seems it's something between the funder and the researcher, right? The researcher applies for funding. We demand that the data man well, we, we demand, we, we, yeah, we require data uh, research data management and, and a data management plan. But in fact, uh, it, it is a joint responsibility. Uh, so, so we had a webinar. Uh, in November, uh, it is recorded. Uh, if you, if you, it was really interesting. And Sarah Jones, who is well known in the uh, DMP uh, online community, 
was uh, our keynote speaker and, and moderated a really interesting debate. Yeah, she, she, she did, she reminded us that uh, fair data and RDM, they, these are joint responsibilities. Uh, we need to embrace uh, parallel communities such as open science communities, but we need services that enable FAIR. So as a funder, we do, uh, yeah, we impose or we, we have uh, mandates regarding data management planning, but researchers need to have access to infrastructure and service pro providers, and also to support, to, to, to guide, to training, to instruction, so uh, institutional, such as institutional research support and people, uh, RDM specialists, data stewards, lab managers, so we do see fair data, art, research data management and open data as a joint responsibility. It's not just between us and the researchers, there's a whole uh, well, ecosystem uh, stakeholder group uh, involved. Um, and we've been uh, doing a lot in terms of uh, supporting RDM, open and fair data, working together uh, with uh, other stakeholders. So in terms of policies and grant requirements, we share practice and align and align policies and requirements with other funding agencies in Europe, in particular with uh, Science Europe. We are a member of Science Europe, which is a, a, an umbrella organization for uh, mainly for research funders, but it also has some members that are research performing organizations. We do provide financial support for infrastructure and services. Uh, and we also uh, uh, think carefully about rewards and incentives. And I'm going to, this is just a summary. These are some of the things we do. And, and, and now I'll, I'll talk uh, a little bit in, in more detail about all of these areas. Uh, so since 2020, we so we introduced the policy in 2016, but we updated it in 2020. And that one of the reasons why is because we worked together in 2018, uh, we worked together with Science Europe. And, and this was something that actually, it's an idea that came from uh, our former uh, president, Stan Gillen. He championed, he thought it was important for funders to align policy around data management in Europe. So in 2020, this, uh, this project was started and culminated with the publication of the Science Europe Practical Guide to the International Alignment of Research Data Management, which includes core requirements for, for data management plans. So in 2020, we um, updated uh, and implemented our data management plan template according to the guidelines from Science Europe. And this is to ensure yeah, alignment uh, between the funders across Europe. Also because researchers are very mobile, they might be doing their PhDs or postdocs in one country, but then they, they move to another country. So it's important that they don't face completely different uh, requirements as they move uh, in, uh, as part of their careers. Another thing we are, have been doing since 2020 also to make life easier for researchers um, is to allow the use of uh, institutional DMP templates, but they need to be approved by NVO. And we, so we evaluate uh, institutional DMP templates according to the Science Europe core requirements for, for DMPs. And this is, so when we introduced our policy in 2016, it was probably quite unique, but at least in the Netherlands, but uh, after that, a lot of the research of the universities and research institutions also introduced data management policies. And some of them, many of them also started, actually most of them now also require data management plans for uh, projects in, in their institutions. So, at some point, it became uh, yeah. The situation arose that researchers had to uh, complete a, a, a data management plan for the funder and one from the institution. So we wanted to avoid that. We wanted to make life easier for the researchers, for us, for the institutions. So we now allow this uh, approve this institutional DMP templates. And, and yeah, it's been actually uh, quite interesting. Uh, uh, last two years, uh, I've uh, had, yeah, we, we sit together 
uh, with uh, the institutions and, and, and we look at the templates and uh, um, yeah, and make agreements on um, how the template can uh, serve the funder and the institutions. I have to say that the, the funder, the institutional templates tend to be much more detailed than the fund, our, the fund, our template, the funder ones, because the institutions uh, also have to make sure that, um, yeah, that, 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 uh, legal, that, that the data meets um, legal requirements and constraints and there are institutional policies. And, and, and since 2020 as well, we made it mandatory for researchers to complete the data management plan in consultation with data stewards or, or, or other research support staff in their home institu institutions. So basically with uh, data management experts at their own institution, home institutions. And the idea again is to make sure that researchers are aware of the support and the facilities that their institutions have to offer to them, but also the policies, guidelines, and any institutional requirements that they need to meet on top of the funder requirements. And also that uh, researchers um, are aware of best practices for research data management. So I think this has been quite successful. Uh, so far, and at, at the bottom, there's a in the slides. There's a I'll share the slides. Um, uh, there's a link to our uh, data management uh, policy page. Uh, and also in 2020, we became a, a subscriber, an institutional uh, subscriber of uh, DMP Online. So that's also a service we provide um, to the researchers because we believe that. A DMP online or a DMP service such as DMP online simplifies the, the data management planning process, both for researchers and institutions. And, and a lot of institutions in the Netherlands have their own uh, DMP online uh, local, um, uh, yeah, uh, they, they have subscriptions to, to DMP online. And, and the main advantage is that the MP Online, of course, brings uh, funder and institutional templates and also support and guidance all under one roof. So it all it makes it easier. So as you've seen, it's all uh, we've been doing a lot to try to make it easier for researchers uh, to comply with our policies, because we believe that as a funder, if we impose policies, we also have to uh, create the conditions uh, for researchers to be able to meet um, the requirements. Um, I said, yeah, we also make investments in, um, in infrastructure and support. And one, uh, so one program we've had was a one-off uh, 4.5 million euro uh, uh, call to support universities to further invest in data stewardship support. And these are the local digital competence centers. All universities, all institutions in the Netherlands now have a local digital competence center. Sometimes it's, an, it's the funding um, established one, uh, but in other cases, some universities already had something. So the funding served to expand uh, the, the capacity of local support offices. Uh, and this uh, again, um, so that actually there's been a lot of investment, a lot of data stewards have been hired in the last uh, couple of years uh, with this uh, funding. Uh, and, and this uh, and, and this uh, digital content centers are are they have a network uh, supported by our national SET organization for research and education, and we are also now working on a follow up call uh, to support to for thematic digital content centers that are national um, that are that are organized at national level, but instead of uh, but uh, around uh, uh, research themes. Another thing uh, we've also, yeah, we, we've had policies for many years, but we also, yeah, changing the, yeah, moving also to rewards and incentives. Policies have been, and, and funder mandates have been, have had a very important role in stimulating open science practices and fair data. But we think that for, for these practices to become the norm rather than as a uh, hurdle to, to overcome and, 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 and and yeah, many of you maybe are aware that sometimes researchers see data management planning as a hurdle. We think we need to give more credit and recognition to, to researchers who put open science into practice. 
And so in, in, at the end of 2020, so a lot happened in 2020, I'm now realizing, <laughs> uh, we also launched a, a new funding instrument to stimulate open science uh, and by recognizing uh, and rewarding researchers uh, for open uh, research practices. The call was specifically aimed at supporting researchers to develop, test, implement innovative ways of making research open, accessible, transparent, and reusable. It was like across the whole of, I mean, it, it was, um, the scope was a very wide, all of open science, but including also FAIR data. Um, this, this call, actually, I should say, is um, modeled on the Welcome Trust Open Research Fund. So they were really pioneers in this area. We, we follow on their footsteps. And it's been very uh, successful or uh, very successfully received. We received 167 eligible applications by the deadline in May. And we were able to fund 26 projects, uh, each up to uh, 50,000. So these are small projects of up to 50,000 euro. Uh, and these are also the projects are uh, a max uh, up to one year of duration. We announced 26 projects, a lot of them in the area of fair data, um, a lot of projects uh, for um, interoperability, uh, data repositories. If, if you're curious, uh, uh, we actually just launched an open science in practice webinar series to showcase the projects awarded in an open science fund grant. Uh, uh, grant. The series uh, will cover a wide variety of open science topics to match the, the scope of, of the funding scheme. And it will include also uh, RDM and FAIR data topics. The first uh, webinar in the series will be on the 17th of February and it will focus on uh, open access journals and nonprofit publishing infrastructures. We're planning to have uh, a webinar every two months uh, or so. So the next one will be in April. We'll, we're still working on the, the speakers. Uh, but for now, um, the, the first webinar is on open access journals, also a link there if you're interested in the series or to register for this webinar. Uh, and finally, I want to say something about research software because at the beginning I said we have policies to ensure that research output is as open as possible, uh, as close as necessary, but of course research software is also an important uh, research output uh, that we uh, fund through our grants. We don't have specific policies for software right now, but uh, we've been creating awareness. Uh, we were early endorsers of the five recommendations for FAIR software. This was an, an, a Dutch initiative. And we link uh, to the recommendations, that a link to the recommendations is included in the, the, our data management plan and our DMP guidance. And we are also early adopters of the RDA uh, Research um, Software Alliance uh, Fair Principles for Research Software. And although, so we don't include, we don't include soft, we don't consider software as data. It's not part of our, the way we define data, but we do recognize that software uh, algorithms, scripts and code developed by researchers in the course of their work may be necessary to access and interpret the data. And in, in such cases, the data management plan uh, needs to uh, address research software sustainability and availability. So we have a, a question for software in the data management plan. And when we discuss uh, uh, DMP templates with the institutions for approval, we also require a, a question about research software. Although, so software, we don't have a specific policy, but uh, we address it through our data management policy. But uh, this year we are uh, working together well, we started last year, but uh, we, we're working together with the Netherlands eScience Center to develop national guidelines for software management plans. We want to do something similar to the Science Europe core requirements for data management plans. We, we want to create uh, some guidelines and core requirements for software management plans. Uh, these are, this is a national initiative for now. Uh, we have uh, a working group uh, with uh, many experts from our uh, Dutch uh, community 
and we expect to have some uh, results before the summer. I'm really excited about, about this work. Uh, and, and hopefully we'll um, then expand our policy uh, to research and software. This is all I have for, for this morning. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll take questions. I'll stop sharing as well. So I can see, you. oh, I see there's lots of, uh, the chat is full, <laughs> but I was told by the organizers not to worry about the chat, so I won't worry about the chat. Thank you so much, Maria, for your presentation. Really insightful. Um, so far, we received one question in the chat, but um, everyone else, feel free to unmute yourself. Uh, one question came from Philippa from University of Dundee. Hi, Maria. How many people work uh, on RDM at NWO? So, <laughs> Yes, interesting question. Yeah, in a sense, yeah, I mean, at the policy level, yeah, it's me. <laughs> well, we, we have a very small open science team and I'm the RDM person for, yeah, in, in our open science team. Uh, but then the data management plans, we uh, are actually reviewed. So as I, I said, that researchers need to submit a research data management plan. And then it's a condition to start a project, which means uh, they, they, the, the plans are reviewed and they are reviewed by the grant officers or by uh, the project. So once the project is funded, they go, to the, they, they go into project management state. So it's a, a staff that work at project management level. They will, so they are not formally RDM staff, but they review uh, uh, the plans. So there's a lot of people, although I have to say they are not specialists in research data management. And that, that's a big challenge for many funders that we don't have, yeah, we don't have a huge RDM capacity. So, so the, the plans are reviewed, but they're not reviewed by RDM specialists, unfortunately. But it would be quite difficult for us to, to build that, to, 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 yeah, to build that capacity or hire that capacity. Thank you. That's a really good question, actually. If there are any more questions, feel free to unmute yourself or add the questions into the chat. Hello. If possible, I'd like to ask another question then, because nobody else has. Um, I, I mean, I've been contacted by a researcher just today asking about funding to make their software open. Um, do you see yourselves doing that, creating funding grants for, for making software open? Well, personally, I'd love to create such a fund. Um, yeah, yeah, in our open science fund, although the, the, it was uh, the call was not meant just to open a, a, a piece of, of software, but there's a lot of uh, open source software being funded through that open science fund. But it's more under tools that are useful for open science. I think you're right. There's there's actually a lack of funding uh, in that area. I'm also in um in the RISA the, the research uh, software. Alliance, yeah, RISA Research Software Alliance, which is the equivalent of the RDA for software. They have a funders group, which we met this month for the first time. Yeah, and as funders, we are talking about that. How, how can we, um, yeah, what can we do? But yeah, I, there, there aren't, uh, I think it's something we should be doing. Um, there are not in, yeah there is not enough funding in, in that area and, and actually we did receive a lot of applications for in our open science fund many applications were for funding open source software mm -hmm. thank you but I, I have to say i think uk are right they are probably doing better than we are in the i think epsrc and um I think they do have some software specific calls. I had a look there. I think UKRI yeah. are, are doing better than many, many European funders in that area, actually. Yeah. Oh, how many, I, yeah, how many institute, I'd have to count them, but there are many of them actually. Uh, I'd have to go to our website and, uh, but it's more than 10, it's maybe 20. Uh, 
something like that. If I think off the top of my head. Um, and I have to say, we also, so we have, um, we work very close together with uh, Zone and Ve, which is uh, our, uh, well, they, they are, they are, um, we work right, yeah, they're, they're not part of NVO, uh, they're separate for us, but they fund um, uh, health, uh, health research, which, uh, healthcare research. So we actually work together with them to approve uh, this, the DMP so that the approved, so there's only one approved uh, template that is then approved by both funders in the Netherlands, the, the main funders in the Netherlands. Oh, have, yeah, sorry, we have received another question from Jos and then somebody's having their hand raised. So if we just go through the question first, there was one from, uh, sorry if I pronounce it incorrectly, Jos uh, Albers. Um, if a researcher collects research data and also creates software, does he have to write data management plan and software management plan in the future? Yeah, that, that's a great question. I also have that question, and that's a question the, that working group I mentioned. They, I, uh, that's one of the questions they're going to answer. Uh, and software, well, data, is, uh, of course, data is also complicated, but software, there. So I, I, I can think. Uh, depends on the software. So I, I, I I'm going to wait for that working group to, to to think about this. But in my mind, I can think that you know, if a researcher just wrote you know like a couple of Python or MATLAB scripts, maybe you don't need a separate uh, software management plan. But if you're writing a software package that is going to be really used by that is like something a bigger thing, or well, you you yeah. If it's if it's the main output of the research, then maybe definitely a software management plan. When there's data and software, I think yeah. I think we have to be careful not to overburden researchers. We have to, with two plans, so we have. And that's one of the things the working group uh, is looking at is. Uh, yeah, are there types of software or situations where the software can be. Um, under the data management plan, or does it require a separate, a separate software management plan? And oh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm coordinating the work of the working group, but I'm not involved in it. And I also think the idea, I, I, what I'd like to see from that working group is this core requirements, that, right? Like, and then I think people can decide, will you include those questions under a data management plan? You know, like a bit like modules like Lego that you can play with. So, so for my type of, you know, for my institution, for my type of research, this I'll include these questions and they'll be part of the data management plan. And for other people, it will be a, a software management plan. So yeah, I don't know the answer yet, but I think we, yeah, we do need to, to make sure that we, uh, make the best out of the two formats and, and do not overburden researchers uh, with too much paper, well, red tape. Oh, we shouldn't see, that. this is not red tape, but in any case, uh, we have to, yeah, to make, make it as easy as possible and as not too confusing for researchers. So Petra is having her hand up. Um, if you'd like to unmute yourself, Petra. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, to compliment Maria because uh, the approach that NWO is taking uh, really helps us as institutes because uh, we can ask our own researchers what we want to have on on the information in our DMP, and uh, it it puts the responsibility where it should be. So it's at the researcher because he or she needs to think about uh, their data and where, how they are going to share it and make it available for reuse in the future. And uh, I think uh, what Maria and NWO are doing also in uh, consultation with the other funders is uh, for us, it's really important. Thank you, Petra. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Just giving one more minute to anyone. Either feel free to still add your question into the chat or unmute yourself. I don't see anyone in the moment. 
Okay, well, many thanks, Maria. Um, it's been a really interesting talk. I'll just leave it here with the questions for you, but if there are any more questions, feel free uh, to send them to us and we'll pass them to Maria even after the session if Maria is happy to answer any of them. Um, and we'll, we'll just give you a few more updates uh, from our team and take questions if there are any for the DMP online team, if it's all right. But again, many thanks, Maria. Uh, it's been really insightful and thank you all for your questions for Maria as well. Hope thank you. Answered. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. And a few more updates now from DMP online. Let me just move a few things around in here. Okay, so um, most of Dutch university and maybe some of the UK universities um, have been aware about what has what is referred as SQL injection vulnerability, um, which has been fixed. I won't be uh, going into the details of the technicality and what has been going on there, but we do have a blog post. And if you do have more technical questions, um, um, we are joined today by one of our software developers in the case you want to ask uh, any more technical questions. But I just wanted to direct everyone. We, we do have now a blog post and um, it has been reported by over the Christmas day by Rory O'Connor from the Erasmus University um, as a part of a security sweep uh, of application about the vulnerability in the tool. And what we have done over the Christmas break, um, our main software developer actually um, ex um, exploited the vulnerability and uh, went through it through our test servers. And he couldn't really, um, he at best could delay a query, uh, which would only affect the one person making the query. Um, again, if you want to know a little bit more, just feel free to do go um, into the details of the blog post. But uh, we couldn't really replicate it as much. And this doesn't mean that it wasn't possible, but given the lack of evidence and the exploit um, had been used and the failure to come up with example that did harm, we are reassured that the potential exploit has not been used for harm. And uh, we are doing undertaking a sweep of code base to look for any other similar examples of potential vulnerabilities. Okay. And um, yeah, like I said, it's been fixed uh, by our software developer, Ray Carrick, uh, who worked very hard over the Christmas break. So, but again, if you would like any more information, Diana already shared the details of the blog post. And if you have any more technical questions, uh, Again, feel free to either unmute yourself or send us a message either to DMP online at dcc.ac.uk if you think of any later on or just now um, if you have any. If not, like I said, you can always send us more questions to the main help desk and we'll get back to you um, if there are any. Um, I also wanted to share with you um, hiring updates. So as you know, we have been hiring for software developers and most recently now we have been joined by Glennis uh, Jacob, uh, who is our new software developer uh, in the MP online team. And Glennis um, is a recent graduate currently undergoing the training with us. So if you want to find out more about Glennis, uh, she recently written a blog post for us as well. So I think Diana is already copying it and pasting it into the chat for you, but uh, we are very happy to be joined by Glennis. And I also wanted to let you know, um, I keep going on and on uh, with my emails about it, uh, but if anybody has missed this, uh, we are running a training for administrator uh, functionalities in February uh, 2022. And if you are interested, there is a link where you can register or just email us at dmponline at dcc.ac.uk if you have more um, questions. But this training will be directed for the administrators and we'll be going through the refresher or maybe for some learning the basic admin functionalities and also uh, how this works for the researchers. So if you're interested to, 
either refresh or learn about the admin features, please feel free to join us. We also have a recent blog post about the difference between DMP2 and DMP online. Sorry, this is my bird uh, going very loud here. Um, and if you're interested to uh, learn more, because these questions very often come up, what's the difference between DMP tool and DMP online? We uh, wrote a short blog post basically explaining our collaboration on the roadmap, as well as highlighting some differences between their work and our work. And we do have a lot of upcoming events. I'd like to invite you all. Uh, we run, as most of you will know by now, monthly drop-in where we tend to have guest speakers. Um, but we are also running, like I mentioned, the DMP online training. And we already agreed on the user group, which will be taking in April, which feels to be far enough, but it's almost the end of January. So going to be uh, just around the corner in no time. So if you want to join us for the user group, please feel free. Um, there is an events page and you can also register your interest or just send us an email to dmponline at dcc.hc.uk. And I'll just hand over to Diana uh, with the questions for the DMP Online team. If that's all right. Hi, um, right, I see that there has been a question submitted by Petra and it's <clears throat> about tidy up uh, data. When will you do the cleanups for all DMP online services that are duplicates for institute names in the system um, resulting from the ROR integration? And this gives problems um, at the LUMC. Um, what is LUMC? Sorry, I don't can't remember off the top of my head. It's the Leiden University Medical Center. Okay, okay. Um, have you been working on this, Magdalena? Uh, Ray, does this make sense? Sorry, I'll unmute. Um, yeah, we're aware of the problem. Um, and we were waiting to do the cleanup until we had um, verified that the raw integration was now sorted and working. Um, we're now at that point. So we're hoping to get the data cleanup done in the next week to two weeks. Um, so we're almost at the time of doing it, but we're, we're well aware of the the problems that it's caused. And uh, yeah, it's been a painful process, but we should be there soon. Okay, thank you, Ray. Um, let me just check the chat, whether anything came in the chat. No. Um, nothing in the chat. Uh, Maybe this has been addressed before. Pre-ticked answers are now included in a PDF export. Will this be sold? This is a question um, from uh, Miriam Brulemans. Um, so you download a PDF and you take questions and download the PDF and these questions and answers are now included. Yeah, we have some uh, preferred answers in, in, uh -huh. uh, in, the, in the tick box options, uh, for instance, for the best practices. And uh, if we pre-tick these answers uh, in our institutional template, they won't be included in the, in the export. So you have to uh, manually save this answer to take these uh, pre ticked answers along in the, in the export. Is this uh, no? Did you raise the ticket for this? Uh, not yet. So it was uh, raised yesterday. <laughs> so I thought it was raised uh, yesterday. I would drop it in uh, in this session. Maybe it was uh, already a no problem. Or else right. I will. Uh, uh, okay. So raised the support ticket yesterday. Not not yet. So uh, I know this. Uh, the drop in session was today. So uh, I expected it to be a, a no problem. So. Uh, I will raise the tickets. Uh, no, so what we can do, we can just take it and I will raise an internal ticket and do some tests and address it with you, Miriam, then let you know about okay. it. So I'll put here action, Magdalena will raise an internal. Uh, okay, I mean, were you aware of this, Magdalena, Ray? No. No. No, I, was, I wasn't aware of it. No. Um, so I think this is something this sounds new. to look into. Thank you. Mm. OK, 
Okay, I'll put an answer here. Anything else? Okay, well, uh, you know where to find us if you have more questions. <laughs> um, you know our email address. Um, and we always get back to you. Um, we always aim to get back to you within 24 hours. So um, always approach us. Um, okay. Anything else, Magdalena? No, thank you. Thank you all. And thank you for your questions. Um, just last few bits and bobs. Uh, I would like to remind you all, do not forget to follow us on Twitter at DMP online on LinkedIn. Uh, there are links and subscribe to our monthly newsletters. Um, if you haven't done so, our next drop in uh, will be on the 15th of February. Um, so in I think three weeks time, half past 10 uh, UK time. And our um, guest speaker this time around will be Petra uh, from Leiden University Medical Center who joined us as well. Thank you very much for being our guest speaker. And if you're interested to see uh, our upcoming drop-ins, there is a full list. I would like to say, Big thank you uh, to Maria uh, for being our guest speaker today and for her very insightful uh, talk and to all for raising your questions um, to, to Maria and to us. And a big thank you uh, to Diana uh, for running the session with me and to Ray um, for uh, being here with us as well. And I hope that you'll join us in a three weeks time for the next drop in. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you. See you. Bye-bye.